Kia ora koutou katoa. It's wonderful to be back here at Nerd Night. So imagine yourself in an intergalactic arena somewhere in the audience. And in stumbles a man just in his shirt sleeves. A black American man. In fact, it's President Obama. <laughs> What's he doing here? He doesn't know. And a booming voice over the speakers says, Mr. President, you have two choices. Behind the door on the left is a duck the size of a horse. Behind the door on the right are 100 horses the size of ducks. <laughs> you must fight, Mr. President, and your drones cannot avail you now. Which door <laughs> will you choose? Now, President Obama was faced with this very question in a press conference about 10 years ago. Would you rather fight 100 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? And this question had, in fact, was not original to that press conference. It had been dreamed up on a talk show um, in, the state, in the UK a few years before, and since then it's popped up as a popular question for celebrities and in interviews because, you know, it encourages a bit of lateral thinking. It's supposedly indicative. Um, so... The question is this, okay, one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? That's the question I pose to you all tonight. And I'd like you now, without overthinking it, to start. Let's do a first survey. Raise your hands if you would rather fight the horse-sized duck. Okay, the horse-sized duck. Who would rather fight the hundred duck-sized horses? Okay. So it's not as a predominance for the second, but it's still quite a few people that are holding out for the first. You'll be pleased to know that President Obama chose the first. Mm. <laughs> so I'm here to walk you through this question because I think I have some relevant expertise. And I wish, actually, that Obama's team, I was um, no, not long finished with my PhD at the time. If Obama's team had contacted me, I could have helped <laughs> with the question. But, Who's to say? So I'm just uh, pointing it to you. This is a goose I saw last week in Malaysia. And that's not the size of a horse. But I was very, very glad it was behind a fence because it was extremely scary. So I just want you to keep in mind that, you know, ducks, ducks are just small geese. Geese are terrifying. Who's been terrified by a goose here? Right, exactly. This, was form this, was, this thought was in my mind all the time I was putting this together, and it was crystallized by the size of this very... A and look at it, look at the way he's looking at me. <laughs> I did not want to get any closer. I was glad there was a fence. Okay, so I actually did do a PhD on giant flightless birds, the allometry, the scaling, as we'll talk about that in a minute. I gave a talk oh, about 10 years ago, probably, on the evolution of Big Bird here in Christchurch. Was anyone at that talk? Or was it a Pecha Kucha event? Oh, well, good. Anyway, I mentioned that I'd done, actually done a PhD in the evolution of flightless birds. And someone came up to me afterwards, and this is a sad lesson for anyone who's actually currently doing a PhD. Anyone in that sad affair at the moment? Yeah. Uh, and that they said, we loved your talk. It was very funny, especially the joke about doing a PhD in giant flightless birds. <laughs> That was so funny. <laughs> so I'm putting up the title page of my thesis to prove that I really did. <laughs> this, is not, this is a topic that has not been of, of frequent daily use in the subsequent years. Uh, but yeah, I did curate a MOA collection for a while, so I do remember some things about the evolution of flightless birds. Anyway, uh, and there's a graph from my thesis. Look, I made graphs and everything. That's the, uh, if you plot the circumference of the femur bone of a whole bunch of different species of ducks and geese on the vertical axis there, you can see the relationship between them. Thicker femurs, bigger body mass. So I actually measured many bones from many different species of ducks and geese. So when a question about giant or tiny <laughs> ducks and geese comes up, I really felt I had some relevant expertise to contribute. So I'm so pleased to be able to give this talk. Okay, so let's break this question down, as we do in academia, to its component parts. Let's just make sure we're all aware of our terms. So first of all, what do we mean by fighting? Like, it could be Obama, it could be you. Perhaps tomorrow you wake up in an intergalactic arena. Uh, do you have guns, weapons, drones? Do you just have your bare hands? I think bare hands is probably the appropriate, yeah, everyone's nodding, yeah. So we're going to go with, 
we're going to say that you know, single fighting means single unarmed combat to the death or incapacitation of either party. Is that a reasonable? I mean, or or, de or defeat? You know, if the the, the 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 ducks or horses could always just give up, um, we'd have to kill every last one of them, surely. <laughs> So that seems, that seems a fair definition, but we also have to then break down all the other weasel words in this, in this conundrum. So what do we mean by horse size? There's a horse, that's a, an average saddle horse, is about 500 kilos in body mass. Ponies get down to about 200, there are some draft horses that get larger, but this is the horse that you would use for show jumping or, ra or riding, you know, that's an average size for a horse. It seems reasonable, doesn't it? Um, now, what do we mean by horse size? Is body mass the best tool to use? Could we use height or length, the shoulder height and hands? None of these things really apply to a duck. I would like to say that uh, the uh, body mass is probably the best scientific way that we'd measure size of things. It's an indicator that's not affected by shape as much. So we're just gonna go with weight in kilograms as, the, as our size proxy. Okay, so 500 kilos. That's that's quite large. <laughs> Have you been, anyone been close to a horse recently? Yeah, they're not small, are they? <laughs> right? Okay, so that's a horse-sized duck. Uh, what about duck-sized? Well, I mean, okay, think of a duck, quick. What kind of duck? Did anyone say Donald? <laughs> do you want to come up here and do the talk? You obviously... <laughs> You're obviously super funny. Uh, okay, mallard. Actually, that is that surprisingly is that's the common duck that we're seeing on the Avon River. It's not actually an average duck size. I can, I can speak with some authority here. <laughs> I can speak with some authority that uh, is this pointer even going to work? So a mallard is about a, a thousand grams. Um, the average, this is actually a selection of ducks and geese and swans and so forth, all and four birds, if you really want to know. But the average duck mass is around 600 down in the mass there. So a mallard is not, a, a mallard is quite a fairly large duck. There's about 100 species of ducks in the world and the average size is about 600, 700 grams. So 700 grams is the duck you would see, the little diving duck on the Avon at the moment, the New Zealand scalp. That's a, it's a little cute little duck with a yellow eye. I'm sure you've all seen them even if you haven't realised. Uh, they're, they're cute little ducks. That's, that's actually what we mean, I think, when we say duck-sized. Right, okay, so we're going to use 700 grams as our proxy for, you know, a duck-sized horse. Okay, now most people when they picture this, <laughs> they picture this puzzle, they imagine taking a duck, and it's usually a mallard duck, and just sort of inflating it to the size of a horse through magic or something, or a big pump, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> right. And they imagine a similar thing, like you take a horse here, and I didn't want to paste a hundred of these on there because it would have taken too long, um, and you just shrink it down. Right. Now, this is the way that a physicist would approach the problem, <laughs> right? Because physicists are, are simple, bless their hearts, they're simple <laughs> beings. <laughs> you know, and they just, they would just say, well, I think if we shrink it down, you'd find that it actually, that's not going to work. And that's, uh, and that's, that's true, because... If, you, if, this w if this was actually done through Harry Potter magic or something and you, you blew uh, an ordinary, that's a pintail actually, up to the size of a horse, well the first thing that would happen is the pintail would fall over <laughs> because its leg bones would uh, dislocate or snap like twigs. And then it wouldn't be able to breathe because it can't, its airflow mechanism through its lungs wouldn't work because it can't simply pump and breathe air in as fast. It certainly wouldn't be able to fly um, there's no way that the wing loading on those big wings would get it off the ground. Uh, and the poor bird would probably just expire. In fact, Obama could just walk over and kick it to death. <laughs> so that's not, doesn't seem fair, doesn't seem really in the spirit of the contest, does it? And, and a similar problem would come about with these little horses, is that they would all um, run around wrap, with their skinny little legs, which would also snap, uh, and then die of uh, heat loss very fast 
because their little hearts can't pump enough blood to keep their extremities warm, their surface to volume ratios far too high, so the poor little beasts would cool down too much and go into hypothermia. So you'd just have to wait, basically. <laughs> now, this is what would happen if you simply uh, shrunk or grew these things without any consideration of biology, which is what physicists do. Um, they, and, uh, but this doesn't, do you agree that this doesn't seem to be, this seems a bit of a smart ass way of answering the question, isn't it? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, I know you're all smart asses, but it doesn't seem in the spirit of the serious contest. And I don't, I think the, the smug physicist who stands up and says, well, you're all wrong because I think you'll find that actually the scanning doesn't allow that to happen. Yeah, yeah, you're quite right, Mr. Physicist, the scanning doesn't allow that to happen. I did a PhD on scaling. Allometry is the study of shape change with size. Basically, it says you can't just scale things up and down in biology. It doesn't work. You know, things fall over, things, bones break. Um, as you things get larger and smaller, their shape has to change because of the laws of physics. Um, how does that shape change happen? What does, a, what would a horse-sized duck actually look like? So we're gonna actually explore this a bit, a bit better. So just as a refresher for how scaling works, and this is probably the most important slide in the talk because it applies to any number of things in real life, including us. There are three dimensions of objects, so length, so you might say let's make all the ducks twice as long or twice as high, for example. Well, if you did, then the area, the surface area, goes up, not, is not doubled, but becomes four times as high, so it increases at this is the square of the linear measurement. And the volume of doubling the length of something increases by eight times, so the cube of the linear measurement. So that means when you make something bigger, its surface area increases faster than its length, and its volume increases much faster than that. So the ra ratio of surface area to volume gets out of whack. What that means in real life is that as animals get bigger and smaller, the amount of relative surface area changes. So big animals suffer from overheating because they've got not enough surface area for all of the internal metabolism. Small animals have the opposite problem. They're mostly surface, so they lose heat very rapidly. So they either have to eat a lot, keep their heart rate up, or cover themselves in fur. Whereas large animals often have naked skin like elements, elephants because they have to lose heat. They have big flappy ears to try and lose heat. That's why elephants have big ears. So a lot of biology is actually following the constraints of allometry. Because volume is close enough to body mass, then we also look at that ratio as well. So if something wants to get off the ground, you can make its wings twice as long the surface area of the wings will be four times the size, but the mass of the bird will be eight times as much. So it can't lift the same amount, which is why the giant eagle skeleton sculptures in Wellington Airport always really annoy me. <laughs> because the wing loading is far too high. I mean, they need much larger wings. Then you run into the second problem. If you just make the wings gigantic, then the uh, bending stress on the bones means they're going to shatter unless you make the bones extra massive and then the wing becomes heavier and then the wing becomes too heavy to flap. So the result of this is that today there are no flying birds larger than about 15 kilograms, although there were some larger ones in the past. But that seems to be close to the maximum limit for powered flight in birds right now. And this can be explained reasonably well by allometry. So nothing in evolution really makes sense unless you th remember to take body size into account. Okay, there endeth the sermon. So this, for example, on the right is the femur, the, sh the thigh bone of an emu. And the one on the left is the thigh bone from a uh, much larger bird, um, about 500 kilos actually, um, called Dromornis. Uh, We'll see more of that later on, both Australian birds, but you notice that just increasing the length of that bone dramatically increases the, uh, surf, the surf, sorry, the uh, cross-section, oh, sorry, cross-sectional area, thank you, that you need to stop the bone from simply snapping. Um, bones act like pillars. To make a pillar support more weight, you need to make it wider. It doesn't matter making it longer or make, increasing its mass, it's the area, the, the uh, diameter of a pillar that helps with support. So you can see this is the effect of simply scaling up from one largest bird to one very large bird. 
Okay, so let's go back to our question. So let's look at, do we have, are there any horse-sized ducks that we can use as an example? There are many kinds of ducks, actually, ranging from um, all shapes and sizes. Mergansers, for example, have little teeth instead of beaks. We have an extinct merganser in New Zealand. There's an, a, an extinct Chatham Island flightless duck there, about five kilograms. Finch's duck was a flightless duck that was the most common duck in New Zealand. Uh, lived inland, lived in forests, not the water. Um, one of the largest living ducks in the top left there is the steamer duck, about five to seven kilograms. It can't fly uh, during the height of the mating season because it's put on so much weight and its wings um, aren't quite strong enough. So there's a wide range of ducks, but none of them are the size of a horse. There were larger ducks in recent history. Uh, this is a Moanalo from Hawaii. Whole bunch of species of giant flightless ducks from Hawaii, ranging from 10, 15, maybe 20 kilos. Uh, with a wide range of different beaks. Ducks' beaks change quite a bit. I mean, we only think of ducks as having little flat beaks for dabbling for, uh, for invertebrates and weed. But uh, large ducks like this had turtle-like beaks or shearing beaks for cropping vegetation and often lived far from the water. So these were all wiped out by the first settlers to Hawaii, unfortunately. Um, but in the more recent past, there's a member of the same group of ducks and geese that's the closest thing to a horse-sized duck we can imagine which is this thing from Australia, uh, the Mihirang, or Dromona certainly, which was about 500 kilograms. Um, so a reasonably large and seriform, completely flightless, tiny, tiny little wings, huge beak, arguments over whether it was carnivorous or whether it ate fruit, uh, it's hard to solve. But that would be what we should be thinking of when we're thinking of a horse-sized duck. And you notice there's obvious shape changes that you have to have when you're a horse-sized duck. You're not going to have big functional wings, and your legs are going to have to be big and strong and thick like pillars just to hold you up. You're not waddling around. Um, you're probably going to be eating vegetation all day long if you need to, to power that body, low-quality food, rather than eating little invertebrates. So you may have a big shearing beak like that. So that's probably a better picture of a horse-sized duck. Now let's go back down to the other extreme, and what would a duck-sized horse look like? Well, it's not just going to be a shrunk-down horse. There's a bunch of different species of horses again, and some of them, like Shetland ponies, do get very small, um, but we don't currently living have any really small horses in existence. Even Shetland ponies are quite large for horses. We do have a very good fossil record of horses, and we do know that going right back to the Eocene, um, about 45 million, 50 million years ago, the ancestor of most of today's horses was reasonably small, Eohippus or Hyracotherium, some people call it, um, often described as fox terrier sized. No, it was uh, about 30 kilos based on the latest estimates. Um, didn't have hooves, just four little toes, lived in the forest. But that's still dog size. That's a reasonably large mammal. It's uh, not you know, the size of a duck. What was the size of a duck, remember? 700, kilo, 700 grams. You guys are listening. That's wonderful. OK, so what would uh, a horse that was as small as 700 grams look like? Well, as you get smaller and smaller, the constraints of body size start to take over, and you don't end up with a long, spindly body. You try and minimize your surface-to-volume ratio to stop from losing all that heat and expiring, so you become kind of small and compact. And so equivalents might be a small <laughs> rabbit. Now, just to be clear, that's not the same rabbit that we saw in the Monty Python sketch. Even an ordinary rabbit is actually quite large. It's over a kilo or so, sometimes several kilos if you have a pet rabbit. Um, whereas a small rabbit species like this brush rabbit here is about 700 grams. An average domestic guinea pig is about 700 grams or sometimes larger. So that's actually a better mental picture to have for a herbivorous mammal of about 700 grams in size. Okay, it's not going to be majestically galloping across the plains and herds on long legs. Smaller animals increase their um, let run frequency by moving their legs faster and, uh, r rather than having long legs. So it'll have a, be a sh little short-legged critter uh, that's basically round in profile and eats grass all day. All right, so 
that's more like how our competition should run. So we've got now down to you know some sort of duck, some sort of horse, 700, 500 kilograms, unarmed combat. That's sort of the definitions. Now, now which would we fight? <laughs> would you like to fight a giant a horse, a 500 kilogram duck with big strong legs, or 100 small herbivores <laughs> the size of roughly the size of guinea pigs? Um, and for which, you know, the, for the first, you would probably want some sort of weapon of some kind, or a, a lance or a spear or a rope or something to just get out of its range. For the second, you might just want stout footwear. <laughs> and then bear in mind that, no, you've been told to fight these animals. I don't know if the animals have been trained to fight you, <laughs> um, but I think if you tried to attack the, something the size of Dromornus, it would definitely fight back. Whereas if you tried to attack a hundred, a herd of you know, seven, seven, 70 kilograms of guinea pig, um, they are very likely to just run away in terror. <laughs> and they, I don't think they're going to swarm you. <laughs> and if they are, then there's something obviously else going on here that, that it's out of my control as a, as a simple biologist. But, um, so this, I think, this, this, this sets the question up a little more realistically. Now, this is what I wish the Obama had been armed with before, <laughs> before he made his, in my opinion, my opinion, ill-informed choice. <laughs> now, would we like to poll again? How many people would now like to fight the horse-sized duck? <laughs> Nobody! So we all agree. Oh, one. Okay, thank you for being contrarian. It's good, it's good that there's always one challenging opinion. I'm sure you have a strategy. You may even get, to, you could share your strategy in the questions perhaps, but um, I'm dying to hear it. But the rest of us have all pretty much decided on hands up for fighting, ruthlessly annihilating a <laughs> hundred tiny, terrified herbivores. <laughs> Mr. President, you've made your choice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. And I'm happy to take questions relating to birds, but not necessarily horses. <laughs> one at the back, please. So I know very little about birds apart from being named after one. My name's Tui. Why do large birds seem to have long, elongated necks, whereas small birds never seem to have that? So right. Um, apart from some water birds that need to forage at the bottom of water bodies that they're swimming in, like swans and so forth. Yeah, uh, the reason for that is that large, larger birds tend to walk or run rather than fly. To walk or run efficiently when you're large, you need long legs rather than four little short legs that run really fast. So if you have long legs, you have to have a long neck to be able to reach the ground. So those two things go can enhance why giraffes have long necks. Not to reach the tops of trees, but because otherwise they couldn't graze. So, See, it all makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> this is why biology is so much fun. Okay, um, other questions? Yes, please. I have a slightly bizarre question. I used to live next door to Tilly, actually, 10 years ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you showed lots of different kinds of ducks. Yes. How is a duck defined? Ah. Well, it's not in biology, it's always they descend from a single common ancestor and they're being grouped into the family Anatidae. And you could come up with some characters of ducks that all the things in Anatidae have and that nothing else does have. And that would be something like, I suppose, usually actually be boring things about their internal skeleton rather than simple obvious facts. Because, yeah, they have all different beaks and different colours and so forth. But generally in biology these days we go by the descent um, gr uh, way of clustering things rather than the similarity or features way of clustering things. So they'll be usually be using DNA to show that all current ducks descend from a single ancestor which actually lived in around the Cretaceous I think uh, which was sort of something in between a goose and a duck. And there is a thing if you come from Australia you might be familiar with the magpie goose which is a fairly common suburban water bird that looks like a halfway between a goose and a duck and it is basically halfway between a goose and a duck. It's a branch off from early on that evolutionary tree. Of modern living duck species, which one would you be most afraid of? No reason I'm asking. <laughs> oh jeez. That's a very good question. 
<laughs> well, I've just been in two weeks in Penang, Malaysia, so I would have to say that the uh, domestic duck, particularly the Pekin version, that's commonly sold in roadside food stalls, is probably the one of greatest danger to me, <laughs> because I was eating a lot of street food there, and I, then, I, then halfway through the trip, I went to a wet market and saw how, how ducks are prepared, and that right, I didn't eat any more ducks after that. <laughs> so that's the duck I'm most frightened of. <laughs> the back. <laughs> That's fine. There's a defensive jargon. Allometry is the shape change with size. Scaling is simply shape, simply size change. Allometry is how the shape has to change when you scale things. So as we saw, just scaling a duck up, it's going to die, but allometry tells us why or how its leg bones change in proportions as that happens. So yeah, that it's valid, best not to use jargon wherever possible, but there is a technical, allometry is an interesting field that really does have its own particular de um, precise definitions and talks just about that strange case where things have to change in shape. Yeah, no, good question. Tui's already had one. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, okay. <laughs> I've noticed that um, a lot of times that uh, like athletic gear for women is, is t you take a men's thing and you scale it down to make it a, a small female thing and it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, do you know of any examples of an industry where they've actually done elementary well and scaled things down? Oh, more? that's interesting, isn't it? Yes. Well, as you know, as we know from Flight of the Concords, um, <laughs> when Brett was forced to get a woman's uh, wetsuit because, and he says, I'm, as you know, yeah, I'm a man, I'm not a woman. Uh, men and women are actually different shapes. Uh, this may come as a surprise to some of you, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot of issues to do with shape change in women and men. And so, yeah, I think, and I think, I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert on women's clothing, but I understand that it's often not very well made in relationship to the shape, shape change and size of actual human beings. Um, I gather this is a fairly common problem. So, yeah, I think that this is something that is too often neglected in, uh, in fashion. And if you look even at the story of shoes, for example, shoes, you know, shoes didn't used to come in left and right sizes. People would just make one impression and shoes were all the same. So it was made it much easier. You just pick, you know, two shoes from the bin. But uh, it took a long time for the, the footwear industry to realise that, no, actually our bodies are slightly different shapes. And as soon as you do that, clothes become much nicer. But yes, it's not my area of expertise, but it's a really interesting parallel to draw. Yeah, shape change in people is just the same as in ducks. <coughs> 